wonderful place, and we do quite a few marriages, both for people uh, inside the family of grace and, and for those outside. Uh, but to be married in an Episcopal church, we have some rules. And the rules are, you have to uh, have what's called premarital counseling. You have to meet with me or some other ordained uh, minister who can do it for at least uh, four hours. And uh, part of my rules is we have to have a rehearsal before the wedding begins. And uh, some of the wisdom I pass along to the folks that I marry is, uh, is this. And that is, no matter how much we prepare and practice, there is always going to be at least one mistake. There will always be one mistake at least in any, any wedding ceremony. And Pam, I've already told your daughter this. She's getting ready. There will be a mistake. Uh, there will be a mistake when we do a baptism too. It's up to uh, and the reason why we practice is to make that mistake one of the smallest that it could be. So small, the last wedding I did, is that only the bride and groom and me, only the three of us knew that there was a mistake. And, and I did it. But um, and no one else knew. No one else knew. They knew I went off script. So, uh, so we practice and practice and practice. Now, if Jacob, in our Old Testament reading for this morning, if Jacob had gone to this local Episcopal priest, okay, there weren't Episcopal priests back then, but if he had, say, gone to uh, his local minister, there weren't rabbis either, it was a long time ago, but if he had practiced, if he'd gone through pre martial counseling, if he had done that stuff, this big mistake would have happened. Because you see, what happened, he wanted to marry Rachel. He loved Rachel. He worked seven years to earn the right to marry Rachel. And then on his wedding day, she was switched for her older daughter, Leah. And he married Leah instead. She had just gone through her counseling. I, I would really make sure that mistake was bad. But, uh, another thing that I require of the people that I'm married is that we are signing a legal contract in the state of California. And as a legal contract, those who are witnesses and those who are signing, right and room, they must be of sound mind and heart and they can't be under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And I tell them quite plainly, both at the rehearsal and before the wedding begins, if any of you are under the influence of alcohol, I will wait. Because you cannot sign a contract unless you are of sound and all that. So, there's no drinking before the service begins. If Jacob had followed that simple rule, just follow that. You see, the, the service, the wedding service, the party started before the service itself. Started probably around 2 in the afternoon. Started with drinks and lots of food. And by the time the sun had set, that's when they rolled around to the actual marriage part. By the time it was dark, it was easy for Laban, his uh, father in law, also his uncle, uh, to marry. <laughs> how it works. Uh, he had to marry with her. Uh, it allowed Laban to take his oldest daughter Leah and switch her in place of Rachel. So a couple of simple rules would have stopped. But the wedding went on, uh, not as planned, but the wedding went on. And Jacob woke up in the morning. Now if you can imagine Jacob, seven years working for this one day when he gets married. He wakes up in the morning, a little foggy up here, if you know what I mean, and looks over and it's not the woman of his dreams. It's his sister. So he rushes out and confronts his now father-in-law. What have you done to me? And his dad said, well, you know, we've got this custom in the land where I have to marry my oldest off before I can marry my youngest. And again, if you found a local fiscal priest, we would have highlighted the laws of that area and said, you know, maybe you should wait until Rachel gets married, until Leah gets married. So it was a big switcheroo. Now, the interesting thing about this reading is there is some good news in it. There's some really, actually, really good news within this story. And you might be wondering, where is the good news? Where is the gospel story within this Old Testament reading? If you look closely, you'll notice the name of the Lord, God, El Shaddai, any, none of that is mentioned. There are no prayers. There are no thanksgivings. There are no offerings to God. It's completely devoid. It's one of the only readings you'll hear on a Sunday morning where God isn't mentioned in the Old Testament. Very interesting. So let me tell you a little bit about Jacob. Now, uh, last week we heard about Jacob, 
and he was the second born. He had an older brother named Esau. Remember Esau? He was a strong, tough, burly guy who went out hunting, who put the elk over his shoulders and carried in. Where Jacob preferred to be at home and preferred to make soup and to write poetry. Remember that? Okay. So Jacob, being crafty, noticed that his dad, Isaac, was on his deathbed. And Isaac's eyes were dull. He couldn't see very well. And uh, Isaac started calling out for Esau because he was about to die, and he was going to bless the firstborn with everything that he has. So Jacob, seeing the opportunity, goes in, poses as his brother, and receives the blessing for himself. This is not General Hospital. This is the Old Testament. Marrying within the family and stealing birthrights. It's interesting. This is the stuff that soap operas are written about. So he goes in and steals his, his oldest brother's birthright, and then he leaves, he runs, because Esau is going to kill him. Because the only way to get your birthright back is if your brother were to die. And so he runs and runs and runs. And that is when he finally falls asleep, he has a vision of the stairway to heaven, and he sees the angels coming up and going down from heaven, and God says, uh, I will bless you. I will bring lots of descendants, and eventually they will be returned back to this place. It's the first time that Jacob has seen God, and it's done in a very dramatic visual way on the day that he was running for his life. So the reason why he fled is he was going to be killed, and he was told to go to Laban's house, because this is his mom's brother, and she uh, wants him to marry within the family. So he's heading off to go visit, and at that moment, at that moment, while he's running, he sees some shepherds coming towards him, and the most beautiful woman he's ever seen before in his life. The most beautiful woman he's ever seen. And he decides to show up. And so as the shepherds are coming up with the sheep, there's a big stone that is over an underwater uh, river. And what they do every day about sunset is that they uh, take up the guy and they roll the stone back and the water comes out and the sheep get their drink for the evening. But you have to wait for all the sheep to arrive. Well, Jacob, being a very impulsive, kind of deceitful kind of guy, he decides to roll the stone back himself without the sheep there, but to do it to show off to Rachel. He does it to show off to this girl. So by himself, he grabs the stone, he rolls it back, the water comes out, it, it only waters part of the sheep. And then, in an act of, um, well, you can put your own word in here, he rolls the stone back, he then grabs Rachel, and he kisses her. Wow. He thinks he's on top of the world. And so then Rachel runs back and tells her dad about all the things that she has seen and things that she has done. So, Jacob has a really interesting life. God has said, I will bless you, I will make your descendants more numerous than you can count, and I'm going to give you all this beautiful land. And Jacob, instead of taking patience, decides to do it all himself. Decides to make his own destiny by rolling the stone, by grabbing the girl, and then by making a deal with the dad, I'll work for you for seven years to marry this girl. In contrast, his dad didn't do it that way. His dad is Isaac. And when Isaac was going to get married, when he wanted to be married, he went into a period of discernment. He prayed to God over and over again about highlighting the right woman for him. And then one day, when she sees her riding up on a camel, he literally drops to his knees and he prays, Thank you, God, for all that you've done, and please let it be that woman. <laughs> he prayed. He waited and he prayed. Do you see the distinction between his son, Jacob, who doesn't pray and doesn't wait and forces things for himself? Now, Jacob's grandfather, his name is Abraham, and his grandmother's name is Sarah. We don't know in the Bible anything about Sarah and about Abraham and the way that they had their own courtship. But we do know that when they were old, like 70 years old or so, that when they were 70 years old, God called them out, away from their comfort and out into the wilderness. And then when they were even older, God came by and said, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to have kids. To which Sarah then started laughing and saying, how can that be? I'm ancient and I've never had kids. 
But they prayed, they had a relationship with each other and with God, and they waited, and God blessed them and gave them Isaac. Isaac prayed and waited and found uh, Rebecca, and they got married, and they had uh, Esau and Jacob. Jacob stole his brother's birthright, didn't pray, ran off to a far off land, rolled back a stone all by his own power, grabbed a woman, kissed her, and they worked for seven years together. And then he was bamboozled. Right? How do you think Esau felt when he got news that his brother had married the wrong woman because they had been switched? You think Esau finally went, yes. <laughs> Alright. But where's the good news in this? An outline story, and I imagine you still haven't heard the good news. Well, let me read a little bit more from our story today uh, out of Genesis. The, uh, the part that our reading for this morning doesn't have, it ended a little too soon in my opinion. So Jacob, uh, after being really mad, completed his uh, week of having his honeymoon, and then Laban gave him his uh, Rachel as his wife. And then he worked for seven more years after that. Now I imagine the first seven years, uh, the Bible says, ran by really quick. It was just a couple days because he was so much in love. I bet you it's a hunch, not in your eye, bet that the next seven years were a toy. Man, he's married to the wrong woman. She's got a servant. He's then married to another woman, she's got a servant, and all of their friends, and it, that would be on Bravo. This would be a, uh, some sort of reality show. The next seven years were not pleasant for the day. But it goes on. So, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, now Leah is the oldest who was switched. We don't know much about Leah. So was. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb but Rachel was there. Right. Here comes the good news. God, imagine Leah. At the last minute, you're switched in. You know you're not wanted. Any sort of dreams or visions she had when she was 12 years old of how her marriage would be had not come true. And the man that she's married to is wildly in love with her sister. She's unloved. She's feeling left out. But God saw her and he opened her womb. Leah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Reuben. She conceived again and bore a son, and she named him Simeon. Again she conceived and bore a son, and she named him Levi. She conceived again and bore a son, and this time she named him Judah. So God saw that she was unloved, God opened her womb, not only blessed her with the son, which I'm sorry for all of you that fathers, it was a different day back then, and not sure this way. gave her four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and uh, Judah. Now, if Levi sounds familiar, these are the first four of the twelve tribes of Israel. Born to Jacob will be all twelve tribes of Israel, starting with Reuben. Levi are what are known as the Levites. The Levites are the priests who serve in the temple. And Judah, does that sound familiar in a map? It's the southern part of the kingdom of Israel. It's where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are held. Uh, Judah is the line, or from that tribe, came King David and King Solomon. King Solomon, who built, of course, the first temple. King David, who, of course, made it one nation. And... Out of the line of Judah came the Messiah. God saw that Leah was unloved and opened her womb and bore to her the priests that served in the temple and for goodness sakes gave her the kings of Israel and the Messiah. Wow. This is how God works. This is the nature of God. Those that have been heartbroken, those that have been betrayed, those that have been lied to, those who are on the outside, that's who God loves, blesses, lifts up, and makes beautiful creations out of their life. This is how God works. This is how God works. It is the grace of God that works through the lonely, the outcast, the downtrodden, the lied to, and again, those that have been deceived. 
This is how God works. The kingdom of God was made known through Leah, even though she wasn't loved, even though she wasn't wanted. The kingdom of God's grace is just below the surface of our lives. It's that hidden area. It's so small, it's like yeast that you put into a large amount of flour and out grows bread that feeds the world. The kingdom of God's grace that is just on the surface of our lives. It is like a fine pearl that once you discover you're willing to give up everything just to have that pearl. The kingdom of heaven and of God's grace is just like something as small as a tiny mustard seed that grows into a gigantic tree that gives shade and places for birds to rest. That's the kingdom of God, and that is the nature of how God works. It is present, it is within you in very small amounts that creates something very, very large. So for those of you who married the wrong man, for those of you who have married the wrong woman at a time, for those of you that have a brother or sister who has lied to you and deceived you and has taken things that are not theirs, for those of you that feel like you're on the outside of society, for those of you wondering where God's grace is happening in the world, it is happening in small amounts. The blessings are coming. Just look for it, be patient, and pray for it, as Isaac did and as Abraham did, and they will be made known. And for those of you who have deceived others, who have taken life by your own hands and have rolled back your own rock and have grabbed a girl and kissed her and tried to make your own way and have failed, God will be continuing blessing through you. Nothing will deter the kingdom of God, not even the deceit of humans, not even the deceit of Jacob. Nothing will stand in the way of God's grace and God's love being made known. Until that kingdom is in the world around us, we are one people with one love, no more war, no more hatred. It is coming, it is small, and it's going to be huge. Let all of us that have treasure, both old and new, bring them out in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.